companies like policymakers or anybody who's trying to see what how much infrastructure is out there for EVs. So we are the number one um, app. There's really not a lot of competition out there. We used to be two companies. It was Recargo and Plugshare, and then Recargo um, acquired Plugshare, and so now we're just one company, and we all work together. And um, so key features, charging station locator, and then driver messaging back and forth, and then plug score, which I'll talk a little bit more about in mobile payments. So at this point, I mean, if you were to look at this map, you know, in 2010 when the Leaf and the Volt came out, we definitely have progressed pretty far. Um, as you can see, most of it is, is most of the infrastructure is, you know, focused around the, the coastal regions, but um, the hot spots are in the West Coast and East Coast, Florida, and um, we'll get into a little bit more of what that, what that contains. And then really pretty much the app usage pretty much mimics where the chargers are. Um, but it's interesting to note that, you know, where people are checking in is, if you look in Oregon, for example, a lot of it is along the corridor and then up 101. And when you see the map of the West Coast Central Highway, it'll get pretty much overlay it like that and see where the popular app usage is. And the way that we get our information is a variety of ways. Um, from automakers, we get it directly because we've got automakers like Nissan putting in chargers on their own. And uh, network partner API, so we get that streamed directly to our app. And it's updated every five minutes. It's also crowdsourced, which is a which is where most of our most accurate data comes from. As sad as that sounds, um, people in the industry sometimes question that and say, oh, what if it's not right? And, but most of the time when we do our editorial review with our team that we have on board, it's almost always correct. And then we go back to the network and there's some issues with theirs. So anyway, so we load all of that into our app and that's populated out to the plug share platform. But you know, it's real time availability where you can see the chargers available. Um, and then what's the rating? And then in turn, we filter all of that data out to um, the in vehicle nav display. So, some of you might not realize this, but cars like the Kia Soul, they're in, their nav system is actually powered by PlugShare because a lot of the automakers are realizing that it's not really best to try to recreate what's already out there. So, they're just trying to project what people are already seeing on their phones. So, yeah, you can locate an EV charging station, it's color coded by you know, fast charger, I'm sure you all are familiar with this. Um, you can actually plan a trip now with PlugShare, so you just put it in point A to point B, and it populates a recommended route for you based on where you're heading, and you can filter, of course, to see where other people are charging. It's sort of creepy a little bit if you're not into sharing where you're at, but if you want to check um, activity in the area and who else is charging, you can do that too. I always find it interesting. I mean, we have launched recently Pay with PlugShare. There aren't the, the charging station manufacturers, or some of them, they're on board, but we're, we have others that are in the pipeline. So basically, we wouldn't need to have um, all of those fun cards on your keychain. We basically just you open the app, and if it's compatible with our app, you can pay <coughs> share there and just type in your credit card. And it actually takes less than 30 seconds. Uh, I'll show you the process there. And then you'll have the credit card saved in there, so you never have to really think about it. So basically, first step is you come up to the charger, and then it'll tell you that it's paid with plug share. Ready, we've got one here in Jordan, the wall ring. And then it says it's available, <coughs> type in the credit card information, and you're done. Less than 30 seconds. Um, at this point, we have over 120,000 registered users. And usually, um, when EV driver adoption increases, it typically mimics what the plug share app usage is. So it's pretty close um, to that. The people who don't use it as much, we hypothesize there are maybe Chevy Volt users who don't really need to find chargers or maybe they're just not charging as much. Um, Toyota Prius, there's a lot of those in California that pretty much bought the car so they can have access to the HOV lane. And um, yeah, we've got 300,000 mobile device installs so you can see a lot of people are just downloading it for information purposes. <laughs> App quality is pretty high, I'm happy with it. These are some of our partners. So Tesla, they have a browser system in their um, car and PlugShare has powers that as well, work with a lot of other utilities, which is some of the things that we do at PlugShare. We don't just have the app, we actually work with automakers on consulting and we have research and get mobile payments and data license, licensing and um, embeddable charging maps. So if you want to put something on your website, you can just do that for free on there. And we also train dealers. 
So another thing that we do is plug share guide. This is something that I launched when I came on board to help provide consulting on infrastructure deployment, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And then we'll go into the West Coast Electric Highway and some of the things that you can do once you've actually put the investment into the infrastructure. So right now what we're working on is the California Electric Highway. They just put out a solicitation for that to finish their portion of the Interstate 5, which is the main arterial that runs through all three states on the West Coast. We've been working on that. Um, Pacific Gas and Electric, we're working with them to identify 500 sites for DC fast charging for their own purposes, but also for stakeholders interested. So this is what I'm here to talk about mostly today, which is the West Coast Electric Highway. I think there's a lot of um, similarities with, with Florida and you know, the West Coast in terms of maybe what you can do with DOT because at a, or even beyond UT, DOT, but at a federal level, US DOT really does want um, to see this happen, what's happened in Oregon, everywhere. Um, and so they're holding a series of workshops which Doug attended one in Oregon and, and they want to see more fast charging corridors along the highway. So um, I guess as I talk about this, maybe if you pick up on lessons learned, I'm happy to talk with anybody afterwards. But back in 2010, the governor signed an agreement that basically said we'll make Interstate 5 a green highway. Um, that, that term sort of morphed into the electric highway because you know electric vehicles were the ones that automakers were focusing the most on, and there was just more availability there. So we focused on electric. And the first step was to figure out how much money we were going to have, you know, so we ended up getting ARA grant money, which I think a lot of you probably also got back in 2009 and 10. And uh, we used that for the first 10 stations, which, sorry, it was really hard to squeeze the map of like this onto the PowerPoint, but our first 10 that we did was actually um, south of Salem, which is our capital right there, in the mid well, not really the middle, but north here in the valley, in Oregon, and then all the way down to the border with California. So we finished that in March of 2012, March 16th, 2012, we opened it. And then from there, we actually got another grant from USDOT, which was the first time ever funding anything. This is even before they opened up CMAC money to use for infrastructure. And we wanted to go beyond um, the main border with the cities and start to go into the rural communities. So every dot that you see here is a fast charger. So you could, at the time, take your leaf, because that's really all that was out there when we started, and uh, these are all the different locations, and the types of location, locations that we chose, first of all, we started out with a set of parameters that we were working with, so we weren't just going out there and looking for any host site that you know raised their hand. So there, there were some really strict requirements, getting right off the highway, um, you had to have a restroom available, availability somewhere, easy ingress, egress, lighting, those types of things, because we wanted when the driver drove through Oregon and through Washington, we just wanted the experience to be seamless, as seamless as possible, because we didn't want people to be prohibited from actually traveling if they had a bad experience. So we chose AeroVironment, and we deployed their fast charging um, from 2010 through 2015. And this is just kind of my capturing of what I learned the most on. The, the biggest, this is the biggest requirement that we had in the beginning. I'm glad that we had this in mind because we've seen a lot of issues with infrastructure that's been deployed. I'm sure, you guys have had situations all over the place just in terms of, you know, an EV driver coming up to a charger and it doesn't work. And I think, you know, in the beginning we were all willing to deal with those growing pains because no one really wanted to say anything because, you know, the EV industry was starting and sort of, you know, didn't want to have any controversy, mire really great projects that were going on. So. Um, that's the number one thing that we care about at PlugShare as well because our users give us feedback and sometimes the users don't know who to blame. Sometimes they blame PlugShare, sometimes they blame the host site, sometimes they blame, you know, if they see the manufacturer's name, you just really, there's no one person that they blame. And so it's just important for all of us to work together to make sure that the user experience is as delightful as possible because, you know, we all know that the car's range are limited in some ways and in a couple of years that won't be the case with the 200 mile cars coming on board, but um, what we're interested in are beyond the early adopters and kind of the next phase of early majority um, drivers and so we're trying to think at least two years ahead to accommodate those types of, uh, this is the psychology behind the charging there versus thinking about what the current fleet of cars out there and how they operate. The other thing that was really helpful was um, in Washington they did this as well, is determining a single point of contact because 
especially in California, I would say, and I know a lot of you kind of connected to that world, but there's just so many different agencies and so much different, so many different little projects going on that it's sometimes hard for manufacturers, network operators to get a sense of the full landscape of what's out there, what's going on. So one person's putting in a charger here, and then the host site gets contacted by another company, and they just assume that all of us EV people are the same company, and we're all sort of working together. And it can lead to some issues, so having kind of a point person to filter everything through is important. Um, another thing is branding. It sounds kind of beyond maybe a government um, responsibility or even in the <coughs> private world it can be, I think, sometimes overlooked too much, where the station needs to somewhat look the same. If it's part of a larger network, the user really needs to understand that. And I think regardless of whether they use the entire network, what we've seen is they, they can identify with it and it gives them a sense of, okay, there's more out there and what I'm experiencing, I could experience somewhere else, so therefore I will drive my electric car more. Because it's one thing if somebody buys a car, but then beyond that, are they actually driving it, and are they actually improving air quality? They're just leaving it parked in their garage and using their other car because they don't want to worry about charging, and then there's a problem there. Um, the other thing is recognition, and just being able to articulate what we're talking about, because again, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of different charges out there. Um, developing parameters for host site specs was very helpful because, well, one reason is because when other host sites get mad that they didn't get the host site, um, you know, you've got people calling you, why didn't I get the charger here? Well, it's really easy to say, you didn't have a transformer, we, you know, it, it would cost too much to trench, you know, maybe you couldn't get an easement signed by an adjacent property. Um, there's just a lot of different things that go into it, and even when you're dealing with a particular location off of the highway, you might see a lot of development, and then you might only end up with two or three sites that are viable candidates. And you're thinking, wow, there's just so much out there, but a lot of times the power is on the other side of the road, so you have four, there's just so many details that go into it. So it's important to kind of keep a wide canvas of an area, but also have a set of parameters that you can go back to and rally around. Um, proactive utility involvement. So when we went out and looked at sites, the first people that I contacted were the different power companies. We had 22 different <laughs> power companies that I had to deal with for all, not had to deal with, but you know, worked with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> we had IOUs, um, to unis, and it was, I, I, I stopped kind of having preconceived notions of what was going to happen when I got to the point of actually getting the transformer in because just when I thought I figured it out, somebody would say, oh yeah, we could do that easy, real cheap. So it's kind of funny, but um, even with, you know, we did over 40 sites, it's still, it, it's still not a science yet. But um, yeah, so proactive utility involvement, have them visiting the site with you and then having, um, not just giving them a bunch of potential sites, but doing your research first and then giving them like maybe five, six, seven sites that are potentials and then they'll help you whittle that down pretty quickly. And then, um, and a lot of times too, the utilities have customer relationships already too, especially larger companies, so that helps when you're having trouble finding a site that will work or having trouble kind of finalizing your deal, which I was talking to a couple people here from Jacksonville and they were saying if you're about to embark on a big undertaking with level two and so you'll find that regardless of whether it's fast charging or level two, they're just very similar issues that you're going to deal with, just personalities. And then beyond this big, you know, national campaign to, um, that's how we're going to sell cars, which I would agree, we definitely need something like that. but. Also, with the investment that's already going in with the infrastructure, I think sometimes you, know, you have your ribbon cutting ceremony, you have all the appropriate people there, you cut it, you're done, you expect the EV drivers to come, but I think really thinking about um, how to engage the host site owners beyond that initial deployment is important because then they'll come in and install more chargers. And we saw that with um, quite a bit of stations in, in the Oregon area where we put a charger in and then it would start to create this radius of level two chargers because other people were jealous <laughs> that they didn't get it and um, they said okay okay they pushed but then they put level two in so that was kind of nice and um, these are just some of the specs that I talked about earlier and just shows you this is one of our stations in, uh, it's a Chevron, it's located in Sisters, Oregon which is, um, I don't know, how many of you have been to Oregon before? So it's in the Cascade, so it's a pretty far drive, for, for, especially if you live in Portland, but we've got stations located along the way to get there. 
And as you can see, we've got our safety bullets up. We have a level two in each location and a fast charger. And that was for two reasons. One is for you know having a duplication so that if there are ever any issues or if somebody's charging up at the fast charger, you can at least plug into the level two. And um, it's, a pretty, it's pretty straightforward. All of our sites look pretty much exactly the same. Um, and then just wanted to go a little bit into uh, kind of how we're doing at this point after deploying the charging infrastructure by tying it back in with my job at PlugShare. And so we're really, people love the plug skip score option of our chart of our app because you can avoid, there's so many stations out there that you can make decisions on which charger you want to go to. And there's a, there's a few different little stations here that we're having issues. And I know exactly which stations these are and I know exactly what the issues are. The, the stations operate via the cell phone network communication, so if there's ever, if somebody tries to come up and charge, it'll say error because they need to reboot it and it takes 30 seconds. And so a lot of times in the rural areas we found, um, the charges will always have this error thing every once in a while if somebody hasn't used it, but then once you come up to use it, they can reboot it. So it's just little things like this that the driver comes up and says, oh my gosh, I've driven this far, I'm in the middle of nowhere on the coast and it's not going to work. So those are the types of things I think we need to work through. But for the most part, um, the plug scores have been really high in the West Coast Electric Highway here. The number of reviews are, are high as well, especially in particular in some of these hot spots here that you see. Um, so this shows you, so here we have a comparison of the West Coast Electric Highway plug score versus all of the others if you're outside of the network. And there's quite a bit more very poor ratings and quite a bit more very excellent ratings for the West Coast Electric Highway. We've had great reliability. And um, so I talked a little bit earlier about why we deployed infrastructure. I, I didn't talk too much about what the sort of principle behind it was. You may be wondering why did we spend so much time and money on deploying a network across the state versus focusing on you know particular cities and putting more fast chargers in for multi-unit dwellings. Our thought process back in 2010 was to create this network to induce EV adoption. We didn't, we didn't have a metric of usage as a determinant of success. We really just wanted the concept to be out there. Um, and I've seen a lot more money spent on infrastructure incorrectly and in incorrect locations. But what we've seen is that people are actually using the stations. Um, there's some, of course, that get skipped. You know, we, we put in um, some stations in between just in case, depending on where you're coming from. But um, beyond the current fleet of cars, what, we were, what we're looking at now at PlugShare is, okay, given this information of Tesla, that Tesla has a supercharger network that's out there similar to our approach um, in the West Coast, what are we talking about here for a 200-mile car? And some of you have heard about the Bolt that they've already released um, information on, but there's quite a few other car manufacturers that are probably going to be um, releasing some exciting cars in the same time frame. And, um, what we're looking at is a sample of 2,800 drivers that we did back in 2015. And I hope that you can read it, because I try to make it really big. When we asked the question, imagine you were in the market for your vehicle today, assuming the price size and features of 200 miles of battery only were similar to your current feed, how likely would you be to consider purchasing or leasing? And Embed to us is a mid-range battery electric vehicle. Um, so that's going to be kind of basically your leaf. And then the PHEV is a Chevy Volt. And the Chevy Volt, people are definitely um, a lot, very interested in the 200 mile range, but you can see the difference in how conservative they are. 74% um, of the PHEV owners, or likely owners, were very likely, or likely to purchase. And then the MBEVs, <laughs> those poor leaf drivers were so used to having just 100 miles max, 200 miles is a really exciting concept. So um, there's definitely a demand out there. And this, you know, and this is a um, survey that we did of current EV drivers that use PlugShare. So imagine what this would be if you know, we were talking to people who don't. Um, and then the next, it's kind of a little bit of a controversial subject. Some of you may agree, some of you may disagree. But at PlugShare, we've done a lot of research and analysis on level two. And we're finding that it's not as good of an investment all the time um, in terms of the actual um, appreciation of the EV drivers of level two, it depends on the application. So when it's a workplace charging or MEV, but when it's just a deployed and sort of a scattered approach where you just hope people will come, it doesn't always match up with the driving behavior. So when we ask the question of 
how much charging actually comes from level two for people, we're getting very low percentages even for free. It's not really that much of a differential um, between the Model S and the non-Tesla, so we just grouped them all together. And then um, I really depend on level two charging. Again, um, disagree, pretty strong numbers here. 56% of people disagree with that on non-Tesla. Um, and of course, you know, I don't want to discount Tesla completely for their answer, but I mean, when you're having a car that has 300 miles of range, you're probably going to discount level two probably pretty strongly, but even the non-Teslas are uh, saying they don't use it. But then when you compare level two to fast charging, if it's 200 miles, that's kind of when you get into the sweet spot of, okay, I'm not going to come up to a level two and charge my bigger battery. It's going to take too long and it's more worthwhile to have public fast charging. So. It's just something to consider. I'm not discounting level two completely, but it's just important to think about fast charging, I think, as we move forward, because when people have 200 miles of range, they're either gonna charge at home or they're gonna char wanna charge up at a fast charger um, for the most part, but level twos do have good application. It's just that fast charging is probably gonna be more useful. Um, and then just talk a little bit about brand development. This is just some of the West Coast Electric Highway material that we have at the different locations. The other thing that's kind of great is that, like I was saying earlier, the host sites come in and they, they expand your investment that you already made. So we have a lot of tribal entities that started promoting the charger more and they put billboards up and it's just nice to be able to leave and do your work and then somebody else does more work too. And um, this is an event that we held where we celebrated the first fast charger on US Forest Service land and we're always trying to think about <laughs> Um, what we can do that's interesting, so I came up with this idea to have a um, professional athletes jump over a leaf and put it on Mount Hood. So um, that was pretty fun, and that generated a lot of excitement. They had free skiing for electric vehicles for the weekend, and um, it was the first to see fast charger at a ski resort. So capitalizing on the infrastructure investment and getting more out of it. We created this tourism program where we created um, itineraries for people, so it's kind of a list of places that you should go. If not always, sometimes they have a charging station, but a lot of times it's just on the way from where you're going. So you can go, I don't know, Doug, did you do any of these when you were out in Oregon? No, I tried to. Okay. <laughs> some of them are wine focused, some of them are beer focused. We try to encourage you to make sure that the driver is obviously partaking. <laughs> <laughs> not encouraging drinking drive. No, no, no. Especially when I was at DOT. Um, so, yeah, so we've got these great little, you know, this is the wine country route um, right here. And then this is just takes you out to Mount Hood, and we've got the coastal route, and all sorts of fun places. This is one of the winery pictures of the leaf driving through the beautiful Oregon wine country. And um, the reason that I'm showing these numbers is just to show you again, as a government entity or even as an EV manufacturer, I mean, Nissan has a lot of Twitter followers and Facebook, but how much do people pay attention? So it's like partnering with these entities that people really focus on and are more apt to respond to social media, so like wineries where people are very engaged. They have much greater reach, and so we were able to reach um, quite a bit of people and increase sales. We were at the auto show, made sure we were in the main part of the auto show and not just on some section, you know, tucked away for just the EV. We wanted to make sure we were right on there and entice people with wine. And uh, these are just some of the ads that they put in some of the magazines in the area. And then we just did the release of the Kia Soul EV. Do you guys have the Kia Soul in Florida yet? I don't know if that yet. That, that is a really great car. It's, it's got more range, than, a little bit more range than the Leaf 2, and we have a chance to launch that. Um, it's just great to have another option than just a couple different cars, and I think um, buyers are picking up on that. So, great photo ops there. And then the last thing I just wanted to say is, again, when you invest in infrastructure, the other thing is, is the press, it's hard to get them interested now in any like new station because they just keep coming online and there's really not a story or they're there. But when we have the West Coast Electric Highway, there's a lot, so much coverage, and I think or there's always reporters willing to do something and interested in it, and, and it's anytime you can kind of put a new um, story together, you know, we got Sunset Magazine to take. She drove a lot of miles, at 700 miles in this car. I was really nervous to send her on her way. I, I offered to go with her, but she did great, and uh, that story should be coming out at the end of the year. Um, and then we were in the Oregon Coast Magazine for the publication that's out all year long. So again, your presence is there. 
NPR reporter, <laughs> jumping for joy here, that did a 340 mile trip in one day. He wanted to see if it could be done, and he did it. Had a couple of hiccups, but not many. That was his drama face. <laughs> and uh, we just had some people out from the UK that did a big couple of big stories on the West Coast Electric Highway, so you can even expand your reach to the international market if that's something that you're concerned about. But it's great, again, just a drama segment about EVs in your region, and um, it gives more partnership opportunities. So, yeah, so I'm hoping that that gave you a lot to think about, and I know it's a lot to take in, but um, at PlugShare, we're, we're, we're very interested in seeing EVs succeed everywhere. And so our next focus other than the West Coast is the Southeast, as well as some of the other Western states in the Northeast. And I think there's a lot of untapped opportunity here as long as you have a robust infrastructure set up because people aren't going to buy the car if they don't have the assurance that there's charging. Um, so I'm open to any sort of debate, dialogue, questions. Um, I think we have about 15 minutes for questions. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, I have a car. We do, we don't, we haven't put any charging stations in or anything, that's kind of our next um, stage of our business, but um, destination charging is definitely interesting to us. We get a lot of Tesla destination charging. Tesla, okay. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, your surveys, of course, are, are all highly oriented, and of course, so you get a lot of indifference on Tesla drivers charging. Right. But destination charging is kind of a different story. A good example is, when I'm saying this hotel has destination mm -hmm. charging. So you would get a totally different response right. from Tesla owners regarding That's your that final time. location. On, on level two. I mean, right. obviously, it's right. yeah. faster, but, but uh, overnight Absolutely. it's good enough. Yeah, we see um, destination charging in that same bucket as workplace charging and then maybe if it has a purpose and makes sense and it's not detracting you from your original travel pattern that you would take because we've been looking at UC Davis doing some analysis on just the gas traffic patterns for gasoline vehicles, and if you're a DOT, we look at this all the time. And so as long as it doesn't um, cause people to have to go off the route too much, and it is at their final destination, we see a lot of that. Especially because superchargers aren't really meant to, uh, for people to use all the time, you know, and they don't want people to use them a lot, and I think, well, Tesla's been going around and putting in stations everywhere anyway, so. Um, yeah, I think destination charging in, in our research too, that that's something. Yeah, in fact, it was Tesla told me, I was so sort of surprised that they value destination charging, or destination charging can be more value, more convenient to a Tesla owner than the owner of the Right. It is a destination. Right. Sense, but I had thought that. Right, because you have the range already. Right. So, yeah. I actually, so, so we have some conversation Yeah, and that was a good report. John Smart and Jim Frankfurt, all of them at I know. That's been the struggle, and that's kind of where we're seeing, and we've been doing the research for the past three years, and we have so much user data and so much user feedback that we're getting, giving those to automakers, but no one seems to be making the next step decision, okay, what's next? There's a couple of different big competitors in the EBSC market that have emerged, not the manufacturer market, but the, the actual networks that are the primary networks. And I think both of them are still trying to figure out what the exact business model is. Like, what are people willing to accept as far as charges per? Is it per month? Is it, you know, by actual usage? Which you run into um, issues in some states where you can't actually sell it by usage. But we think, um, from research that I didn't focus on, because I could do a whole presentation on it, in, in analyzing the way that Tesla did it, when you're pairing it up at the front end of the purchase with the car. So you have guaranteed fuel um, because that that's the way to go is the other automakers would hope would do that because um, it's hard to make a case for you know these individual charges it's just so cheap electricity is so cheap in so many areas of the country that it's kind of crazy some of the prices that some of the networks are asking for 
considering how gas fluctuates so much, so having that stability and having an easy comparison to what the other option that is, which is gas, is what we see for the user. Um, but then you don't want to, the free option is also an issue because you need to figure out a way to get people's behavior to operate differently if they're at a charger for too long or not, you know, because the charging etiquette is going to become an issue. So we think that seems to be the best approach that's been developed so far. Um, it's just more difficult for the other automakers because they're trying to cooperate together and they're all speaking different languages. So I think that any automaker that does that, that would be the next step. But we're going to try to step in and do something to solve the problem. Sure. I, I, I don't know if this question is maybe for the whole group as well as it is for you, but if I'm a business and I pay for a parking spot, Okay, and a vehicle sitting in that parking spot for three hours. Mm -hmm. There's a cost to me mm -hmm. for the fact the car just sits there for three hours. And so my question sort of is, you know, adding the electric charger on when I'm already paying for the asphalt and everything else, mm -hmm. is it possible that the charger's a freebie? If you're already paying for that, darn it, why not add it? And where is the price points on that argument? Like, yeah. Okay, just so I understand what you're asking. You're saying that putting an additional asset in the parking space is just improving the yeah, parking I'm, space? Yeah, I'm paying a fortune. Okay. There are places, my, my own university. I would like to have you with me at every Jose conversation. I, 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 for example, I, it seems UC, UCF, the, yeah. the faculty that have parking spots on our main campus, okay, that park a two minute walk from their door, right. I think pay $1,000 a year for the privilege of putting mm -hmm. their car there. There are people in Chicago that pay thirty thousand dollars a year for the park oh, for the life. Right. They buy a parking spot. They pay thirty thousand dollars. Putting a, a, a two charger there for free. It's a no-brainer. It is a no-brainer. So, so I guess I don't know who is that. Is that who? The economics of, of the physical space mm -hmm. and its cost and the yeah. lifetime of that space and the ability to charge. Is there anybody doing that kind of analysis? Um, well, right now, I've just been in talks with UCLA, and we're working on developing a study on the economics of um, how infrastructure impacts EV adoption. But as far as the economics of um, hosting a site, there's been some work that's been done there, and um, a lot of that's posted on USDOE's website. But I will say in my conversations, particularly with my sites within Oregon, um, there's a couple of issues that come up when you try to make that case to um, a host site that you're essentially getting a free asset for something that already cost you money, you already had it empty, you get additional clientele that would normally come to your business. In a lot of cases, that is the case because just with the types of sites. Like if somebody doesn't normally go to Walmart, but then there's a charger there, they're going to go to Walmart shop, spend more than they're actually consuming. Um, but some of the issues that have come up in surprisingly high numbers for smaller businesses is. I don't want to encumber the property for more than a certain period of time because I have these high aspirations of potentially selling my property to a Marriott or you know some Marriott or something like that where they have sort of these intentions but so they're afraid to sign an agreement but yet we need a certain time frame to secure that site just to have an assurance that we'll at least have. So that's one of the things. Um, the other thing is the power costs and sort of retrenching. So again, anytime you have new construction and you're putting it in, that's usually a no-brainer. Um, but even then, there's some people that disagree. But I will say that um, where we're at today versus where we were at three or four years ago, we actually have 20 model, over 20 models of cars available. Um, there's actual physical cars that have been bought, so it's not just projections like what I was having to talk to people about four years ago, which wasn't as easy. And then we also have data on the usage of charging stations, and there's been some companies that have done uh, studies on how much people spend, and there's actually data out there just on how much people spend in general for how often they're in a store. So at Target, you're talking to them of putting in a station and how, how much they spend. They know how much people spend every 10 seconds, I think, or every, for every 30 seconds. So um, depending on the type of site, you know, we were, we're at, we were at um, the one that we did, a Chamber of Commerce, where they really saw the, the benefit there of getting a charger in, but then we tried to work with another similar type of business, and they just thought, it's, taking up the spot, they don't see it as making an existing spot for a car that would already be there. They see it as, oh, this is going to sit there and no one's going to charge, but yet we can't have somebody else park there, so we don't have that many parking spaces. So yeah, when parking's limited, it's just harder to get. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
kind of a convoluted answer. Yeah. Jim, the experience sat down in, in South Florida this much on Miami Beach, that the duration of stay plus the amount of spaces just wouldn't allow us to put any charging down there at all. We have a lot of requests for charging in Miami Beach, but we don't have enough spaces as it is in some of the stores out on the beach that we just couldn't use it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and plus, by the way, Mike's of Publix. I see it, sure. Big grocery store. I was going to say, that's good. Yeah. And, and the other piece being that um, we don't mark the spaces with only, you know, right. EV parks only. So then we have our own little folks parking there, and they're not in the EVs, and we're going to have to increase the operation because then it's not even available to the EV on our and I would imagine that at Publix, we probably would put it up front because that's closer to the power where the, we need to connect with the power. Yeah, we do, but we don't. We yeah. In some cases, then, now you're sort of alienating your, your, your customer base because we have we have uh, handicap parking, we have mobile parking, we <laughs> have all these other things. So you're pushing your client base out farther and farther right. and then you know, putting an immediate charge in and somebody not using it. Right. So that's kind of where the strategic research on siting really comes in and finding maybe not all publics are the appropriate location, but there might be a hot spot. But what we're looking at now is where can we put multi centers because the other approach that Tesla did that's worked really well is having multiple chargers. So it might even scare you more to give up more of your spaces, but it might be. <laughs> but you'll be more successful if you give up more charging spaces at the beginning because people. But um, yeah, and with charging spaces too, the other thing you have to consider is they have to be ADA compliant in most cases um, with the type of funding that you're getting. So you have to take up two spots per space because you have to have in Oregon, well, I think it's federal, but in Oregon you have to be 14 feet. Um, so it's just, yeah, there's definitely some complications with um, I guess sacrificing charging when there's not as many cars out there to so be kind of in this situation where you're trying to encourage people charge. And that's, that's where a strategic location with fast charging would work because people would be in and out, but then there would still be the visibility for your other customers to see that they're not being alienated. I don't know. I'd kind of like to ask, to ask both of you the same question, uh, Mike. The, the, where does the planning piece come in here? Is, if our, are you doing, will you hire an engineering firm then to do the the consulting business that sets where the space may be, or do you have the internal planning? And like they Publix, do you actually have a, obviously you have a planning group that does siting and decides what they're going to do. And like the case you mentioned in Miami Beach, where you, you don't have enough spaces, so you're forced there. But, but if you're going to build a new public store in Tallahassee, somebody starts somewhere to yeah, plan the stuff. In fact, you know, I participate on it. We look at spaces. In the uh, case of quite like Burton stores, any stores that we have are multi level, we have parts on the bottom, or on top, and park garages there. So we look for spaces to where, uh, once again, we don't want to get the, the, the premium spaces where everybody wants to get there because it's either I'm getting out of the lane, I'm getting close to the elevator, I'm getting to the escalator. We tend to go back for spaces where folks aren't going to use them as much. And so we gravitate towards those as opposed to the premium spaces that you're going to see. While it doesn't do well for promoting the EV charging, it does at least, you know, it doesn't take away from it at the same time. So that's basically what we look at internally is looking for spaces that are the top premium spaces. Or, and then and the duplication of our being like with handicap spaces, we might put a, a charger right next to the handicap zone and you get two for one there. Yeah, and as far as the planning, um, a lot of the infrastructure that has been installed thus far has been somewhat planned, but really it's whenever there's funding available, so it kind of creates these little opportunities where usually it's nice to hear that you, you all are being proactive and internally planning it, but sometimes it's somebody coming to the individual host site and asking them to put a charger so it's not always a part of a larger strategic connecting points like my my project was um, but it's more and more becoming larger companies internally planning for their future construction which is really great to hear you know real estate conferences and um, property owners and everything like that are really starting to see this as, a, as an asset. You leave to my second question. When you 
developed the West Coast Highway, we had no queuing models at all. We just picked these spots out of the air because you knew, and that's kind of where I'm leading to. No, we did some serious planning, and that was what I was talking about earlier with the host site parameters. So what we did is we, I'll take you back to the map just to show you exactly how we did that. So none of these stations are physically on the highway. They're all at, at exits. Exits, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, sadly I know all the exit numbers by heart. <laughs> but I can run through them for you. It's really interesting. Um, <laughs> but so what we did is, um, this is an earlier map, so some of these dots mean they were at different stages. But what we did is we started out with, um, go back to this slide really quick. This is just an example piece, but we have an actual document where we started out by, okay, what are we looking for in a host site? And we had certain site qualifications that were minimum, and then certain site qualifications that were ancillary and maybe gave the site extra points. So this was the planning work that went in. And we started out with what I'm kind of calling now as pods, but I didn't call it at the time. But you know based on the range of the car where you need to put the chargers to, to facilitate the range. So first you start with the community level. Then you look, okay, site relative to the highway, if, it's, if you have a certain limitation, like with ours, it was a half mile off the highway. And there was a couple of locations where we couldn't do that because there just wasn't anything there that would work. Uh, but for the most part, yes, you wanted to right off the highway. And then once you start there, we have all these sites in a spreadsheet, which I have this massive spreadsheet, and then you start to whittle, whittle it down based on power. That's your next step besides the accommodations. And then you usually end up with three, we always ended up with somewhat between three and four that were actual candidates. And then from there, then you have to get into the hard part, which is talking to the host site and actually getting them to agree to host it. And that, that took us on average six months, the host site process. The construction process took an average of 17 days. Are you talking about per site, six months per site? But now remember, we did over 40 sites, so those were happening. I was doing all that concurrently, so it's not like I had one site, waited six months, you know what I mean? So we were doing multiple sites, but yeah, six months because- and 17 what? days, you said, just for construction? Mm -hmm. Here we have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. Actually, when um, a lot of this infrastructure first went into the ground, it was all free access, and then it transitioned slowly to a 4K. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing as far as your driver satisfaction? Did the numbers dip and then recover? Did the numbers dip and, and you know, are people favoring and actually changing their behavior to go to free chargers um, where free chargers are available? What are, what are you seeing as far as the driver reaction to a, port, a, a unit that was free going to Fort Bay? Yeah, that's a really good question. So specifically to the West Coast Electric Highway, the DOT, I had before I left put on our website this kind of interactive data simulation where you can look at the different price point moments and see when people stop charging or what ended up happening with the West Coast Electric Highway is they started it free when we first opened it in 2012. And Air Environment, the company that was responsible for operating and maintaining it, paid its electric bills, which one has separate meter except for the Fred Meyer locations, um, which we um, hooked up directly to their power, so it was just part of the, their larger utility costs, which is flip, flip on the radar. So anyway, so it was free actually for a couple of years and really they were just trying to get people part of the network. And then after that, they started implementing a program for $19.99 a month unlimited and or a one-time fee. And the one-time fee was pretty exorbitant. It was $7. $7. So they're obviously trying to get people to just do the $19.99 a month until they forget about it and maybe they use it, maybe they don't, but they're still getting the $20 a month. Um, so there was an initial dip in the number of um, subscribers, and then it slowly started to come back up. But a lot of the reason behind that was these fobs that they had that gave people access to that network just passed out, and like, a lot of people had them. And then there would be a notice that would go out that would say, you have to connect a credit card to this, or <coughs> that will kind of basically be voided. And so then you start to see the escalation of more and more members coming on board. But from an overall perspective, I think to look at it from making conclusions on a nationwide basis, um, USDOE did include some information on that because they were operating within the confines of the EV project, so there was a lot more chargers to look at. Um, we at PlugShare get feedback on our app about how people feel about the pricing, and they're not happy. They're, it's, it's not easy, easily communicated to the driver, first of all. The driver doesn't really understand or know how much is this going to cost me all the time. 
Now some of them are doing it on a per kilowatt hour basis, but it's um, a lot of times drivers are complaining about the fee. Unless they're charging all the time, most people will charge at home. And so I hate to say free is the best way because I don't think it should be free. Um, but there has to be a price point that make, gives a little bit of a profit margin for the person that's operating it, but also allows the driver to understand the total fuel costs. Thank you, Ashton. Just a, a, a personal comment on the, on the power of social media. I've, I've been um, monitoring Ashton's activities for the year and a half I've been involved in the EV. And, um, <laughs> and then when she was at the State Board, and I, you know, I could see her PowerPoint presentation, she always had her contact information. But then she disappeared off the radar for a short period of time when you went to plug share. Oh. And there was this transitional period, and I couldn't get a hold of her. So I tweeted her and said, would you come here and talk about this? <laughs> <laughs> and I got a response, and she sent me her email. So, so that's how it actually ended up here. But thank you so much. And, um, we're going to break for one hour.